Welcome to a couple of Rad Techs podcasts where we bring you an inside look at the world of radiology from the unique perspective of a married couple of radiologic technologists. Together, we have years of experience, exactly 30 years in the field, and we are here to demystify the science of medical imaging. Radiology is the unsung hero of the medical field, providing doctors with crucial images and information that help diagnose and treat illnesses. Join us as we explore the latest techniques, technologies, and innovations in radiology and discover the vital role we play in the healthcare industry. So come along for the ride as we share our passion for radiology as a married couple. Welcome, you guys, to our podcast, A Couple of Rad Techs Podcast. I am Shandria, and today we'll delve into the world of interventional radiology. Join me as I interview a seasoned technologist, Lake Odom. Lake Odom is coming from North Carolina. He is an interventional radiologic technologist, a trainer, an educator, and we're going to talk all things interventional. So if that interests you, if you've never heard of it, if you want to know more, if you're a radiologic technology student, definitely tune into this podcast. Welcome, Lake, to our podcast. And tell us who you are, what it is that you do for our audience. Sure, thanks. I'm Lake Odom. I have been doing interventional since 2010, 2011. I knew by like my third semester in tech school that this is what I wanted to do. I was lucky enough that there was a little program, uh, like a two-semester program at a neighboring county community college that allowed me to do interventional and cardiac cath. And that's one of the things about interventional is it's almost always done like on the job training. And I was lucky enough to get like a didactic program that went along with it, along with having four clinical sites that I got to rotate. So, I mean, three of those were cardiac cath related, but it allowed me to work with a bunch of different doctors and understand a bunch of different perspectives, which is one of the the best things that you can be in interventional is have a have a background of different ways to do the same thing. Um, yeah. And so I worked in a couple of outpatient places. I worked in a dialysis access center. I worked in a hospital setting for about six and a half years. And I worked in industry. And I've worked in an OBL that was focused on high-end embolization, like prostate artery embolization. And I did about a thousand of those cases. And I'm starting a new job that I just started the last couple of weeks at a hospital uh, that involves doing stroke as well. Oh, wow. So that, okay. So you just really piqued my interest with a lot of things you said, because we're going to talk about where interventional is going, because 20 something years ago, When I rotated in school for interventional, you know, all you see is in the hospital, you know, just kind of those basic things. And you just opened up, I think, a can of worms of this conversation when you talked about all of those different specialties and what you're into now. So can you just briefly explain to everyone what is interventional radiology and how does it differ from traditional diagnostic radiology? That's a great question that even the radiologists uh, are trying to figure out. And you're right, there may or may not be a split of separate groups where like interventionals are working separate from the diagnostic guys in the very near future. I think there's a trend in that. But interventional is minimally invasive surgery, image guided surgery through small access holes, typically in arteries and veins, but other parts of the body where you either need to put a drain in something or aspirate out some fluid. So you may put a drain in a kidney or a gallbladder because they're infected. You may aspirate some fluid around somebody's lung or someone's abdomen because of liver cirrhosis. And you may work on their arteries all throughout their body or their venous system for pelvic congestion in women, a varicocele in men or dialysis access, keeping people able to be on those machines and run appropriately when they get on the dialysis machine through their through their arterial to venous system. So like hemodialysis. Hemodialysis. Yeah. My what? dad was on dialysis for 18 years, so I'm pretty familiar with that. Yeah. So like that site, it would be an interventionalist or a interventional nephrologist in an outpatient setting their job to maintain that access, 
And if that access fails, they'll put in a temporary or permanent dialysis access. And there's even endovascular ways to create fistulas now with either magnets or like an ultrasound like hook thing. Okay, so you talked about, I want to kind of go back because there are going to be people listening who are saying, oh, I want it. That's exciting. I want to get into interventional. Oh, he mentioned surgery. And I mean, you, you talked about getting into the vascular system. So, you know, there are some people, they are really into that. And then you mentioned you could do it in an outpatient setting. Most people think surgery in the hospital, you know, down, scrubbing. But we're talking a, a, a type of radiology surgery where it can be, either be done outpatient as well. So what inspired you into to go in a path of the career of interventional radiology? Yeah, so, and this isn't to take away from anything in diagnostic, but I just enjoyed being an active part of patient care when, you know, if you see something, say you get, you see a broken arm on, on x-ray, it's somebody else's job to fix it. Now, if I see a broken vessel or something, it's our job to fix it. So switching into that more active part of care was something that really excited me about interventional. And it just moves at this pace where you're always, you're always doing something new, even if it's the same procedure every time. There's something different about it. So you're constantly learning. New technologies come out all the time. And there will be something that's happening in a parallel lab or something and you you learn a brand new technology that's been that you didn't know about it yesterday so did you go to i'm going to get this question so i'm going to go ahead and just put it out now did you go to radiology school first or did you go to interventional school like how does that work well yes yeah, so i know that mr and is trending that way i know ultrasound is separate i know nuke med is separate Interventional will probably never be separate. Um, so my letters are R, comma, VI. Um, so I sat for a separate registry and I had to do like 200 exams, only, but I could only do 20 of the same. And it's still pretty similar. And they all ask you a bunch of questions when you sit for the registry that are about the pathology and the anatomy, a lot like the regular x-ray exam. So I sat for that like the day that I finished school for traditional x-ray and then I got my got all my stuff and studied. It's a really challenging exam, but yeah, it's yeah. that that's how you get into it. It it's I can only imagine. Yeah, there's just a lot of material that you have to cover um when it comes to interventional and very few for the interventional registry right now and very few labs are seeing the whole thing, like you would have to be in a very special lab in order to see everything that you're going to be tested on. So it takes a little bit of extra study when it comes to sitting for that registry. Yeah. And I like how you, you prefaced what you said, because I think I went to school for radiology as well. I was a top technolo technological student there. My tech skill, technology skills are great. I enjoyed x-ray, but like you, I knew that there was more beyond the diagnostic realm of x-ray. I didn't leave for a specialty modality because I didn't like x-ray. It's, it, it's the basis of everything I know, even though I do CT, a little bit of memo, MR, I've done applications and education. It's just another layer to where we started, which is diagnostic x-ray. And, you know, I absolutely love it. I mean, I, I wish I could, my mind could. I, what we do is so specialized, I think, no matter what modality you're in. That if I tried to go back to X right now after 20 something years, they would probably tell me, go take two seats. And, <laughs> you know, you're slowing us down. Uh, you know, because you have our field is something where you have to be hands on. You got to stay in it. Um, and, and it's really re a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm enjoying this conversation. So let me ask you this other question. When it comes to most common procedures that you perform in interventional radiology, what would be maybe your top three? Uh, so it, it's really lab dependent. So in my first hospital job, it would have been dialysis, fistulograms, and interventions, followed by paracentesis. And so it would have been like a, a, an, an x-ray case, a fluoro case, an ultrasound case, and maybe some thyroid biopsies. Uh, those were pretty common for us, but those were the two main. 
when I did outpatient for with the interventional nephrologist, it was dialysis fistulograms and dialysis catheter placements all day, every day. Mm -hmm. This this current job that I'm in, it's kind of split the there's neuro intervention and there's regular body intervention and it's a cancer center. So there's a lot of chest ports and lines that get done more than anything else. So it's like tunneled pick lines or t they're called power lines. They're, they're like neck sticks, yeah. um, chest ports, dialysis catheters, and then the neuro is doing like cerebral angiograms. So they don't have any ultrasound cases that come to their department. They have kind of, it's being done in a separate area where at my previous job, we ended up with the ultrasound interventions in our department because we got really good at them. So we yeah. could just move where if that ultrasound department who wasn't used to doing it, it would take them four times as long just because they don't have those efficiencies set in. Mm, interesting. That, the, not, that's a good, that is great. I, I appreciate you setting that up like that because as people listen, they're going to, most people, I, I, I listen to students and they're like, I just want to work outpatient because I want to sit down. Yeah. You don't always just sit down and outpatient. Outpatient can sometimes be just as busy, if not busier, than a hospital. Would you agree? So the the outpatient job I just left, I did all the ordering. I did all the inventory. If the printer was broken, I was the one that was asked to see if I could fix it. Like, I didn't sit down because I was yeah. the only technologist. And that's the way that a lot of outpatient labs are set up that are smaller you you may have one or two technologists and like I was responsible for the x-ray camera. So if it didn't start talking to the network that like I had to troubleshoot it. So I never stop. But like if you are in a diagnostic outpatient setting, it may be different at like an urgent care, but people aren't going to let you sit down. They're going to ask you to like help clean the rooms and do other things. So in this job, there's not really that many opportunities to sit down unless you're in like a longer case where it takes mm -hmm. that, you know, like an MR or like an extended nuke med exam. Yeah. Like, but that's, but you're taking care of the patient the whole time. That just may, you may get five minutes to sit down. Hey, you guys, as a radiology technologist, I understand the ultimate task of radiology technologists to bring that coffee into their department every morning without spilling it. So I'm going to introduce you to Bevy. Bevy is perfect for this kind of occasion. If you've got the responsibility of bringing in that much needed coffee to your colleagues in a radiology department, have no fear. Bevy was designed just for us rad techs. It's the problem solver to carrying more beverages than your two hands can hold. This beverage carrier can hold up to 12 drinks securely spill free and fits perfectly in your car. You guys, no more spills, no more accidents. Bevy's innovative design keeps your drinks in place even during the most hectic mornings and as you're trying to carry everything in. And the best part, Bevy is proudly owned and operated by a woman. Join the growing community of satisfied Bevy users and experience the convenience and peace of mind you deserve and your radiology coworkers do too. So don't let spills slow you down. Get your Bevy drink holder today. Keep your car Coffee and drink secure it before they get to the radiology department. Get 20% off too. Use my code RADTEX20. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great. That's great. Okay. Perfect. So when it comes to your most memorable, you've been doing this for a while. So what would be your most memorable procedure that you performed in interventional radiology? Okay. Let's see. I just knocked the camera out. Let me. Oh. Let me get me back in frame. There uh, we go. So yes. at, at my uh, first hospital job, I was working with a vascular surgeon and she had a, a bypass graft that was going to in, in one of the legs and it went down and she texted me. She's like, can you come in and help me get this clot out? And I said, sure, but you got to run it by my manager because vascular surgery at that hospital had never called anyone in. Had never worked in IR suite, but I was like, I can do it. Just make sure everybody else knows because like 
we can't just be going wild in the lab. Right. And so I come in and she's trying to get this clot out with um, this technique um, with a, with a catheter and it just wasn't working. And we had a new device. It's called a penumbra. It's basically a clot aspiration system that's been used to like its current indications would be to suck clot out of like a, I'm not sure if it's on label for a lung, but it can be used in the lung. It can be used mm -hmm. in the leg to suck clot. It can be used to suck clot out of a fistula or the brain as well. So it's just like a, a suction canister but a sterile one. And it's a little bit more high tech than that, but that's an easy way to explain it. So she had never seen this device. I looked at her and said, Hey, do you want to try this? I know how to work the device and you'll just, do you trust me? And she said, of course. And we set it up. We did one pass and the thing, her bypass graft looked like it was brand new when we were done. What? Oh my goodness. So I feel so grateful and lucky that she trusted me enough to like use a device that she had never seen before. So like it was just, it, it, it was just really nice that she trusted me. So that's one of my, one of my favorite stories to tell people. That is a really good story because I know you've run into this all the time where people think literally we just hand doctors tools. We just press buttons. We just yeah. have a, we're just there. All we do is get the right there. Interventional, my rotation through interventional, I think I did like a couple months because I finished all of my clinical exams in school the first year instead of taking the two years because I really wanted to rotate through everything radiology had. I enjoyed interventional. I was, offered a job um, yeah. to learn on a job once I graduated school. I just wasn't able to take a lot of the call. That's why I didn't take it. But it was it was one of the top things. And just because of what you just said, I think really is going to be one of my sound bites because people really need to understand and technologists need to understand too. Radiologic technologists need to understand that we are very essential to the field. Doctors do look to us, um, especially when we are highly skilled at what we do, which obviously you are that a doctor who has never even used an uh, interventional before called and said, hey, can we do it? And you were able to, you knew your tools, you knew your job and able to actually use something for the benefit of the patient. And that was actually my next question. How did it benefit the patient? Can you talk a little bit more? Because I'm visual, I can see it as you're talking. Like I saw the whole story as you were talking. I can see, I don't know what the device looks like, but I can see, you know, what's going on in the x-ray and see it clearing that out. What exactly is it that you guys, if you could kind of paint it for our our listeners, people that don't really know anything about it, how how would you kind of portray that as to what happened? Because I'm thinking vacuum and I see this clock getting sucked out. Yeah. And that's exciting. So basically you have this line of contrast that's going down and just stops. And then there's a gap and the contrast starts. So you can just imagine that this chunk that's like this big on one side of the contrast and the other is just blank. And if you take the device and run it past the, the clot and you turn the aspiration on and you pull it back through, it'll just pick up the clot and you can watch how fast the blood is moving through the line to know whether or not it, you're just pulling straight blood or if you've got into a clot. And so we did one pass, it made the sound that it was supposed to make. And then it was just running like freely. So you knew that it grabs, it was in flowing blood, grabbed something, and then was back in flowing blood. So you knew it grabbed something. And then you, you manage it with the little switch to turn the suction on and off in the line. And we just took a picture and there, the gap was gone or the, the blank space was gone. I, that was that, and that's why he's an educator, you guys. <laughs> he just took that and explained it, and I, I really believe people understand now. You actually shed light on the some of the misconceptions that people have, especially about interventional radiology and radiologic technologists, and how we truly do bring our expertise it benefits the entire medical field. I do want to talk about safety because some people wonder why I'm standing inside of there with all that radiation all the time, you know. Can women work in there? I want to have a baby or men. We're all being radiated. How, what safety measures and exposure are to yourself and to the patient as well? The best shield that you have in that is the doctor's. So you make sure he's standing between you and the table of the two. 
they're the ones that really need to go a little bit extra and above and beyond when it comes to radiation safety. I think there's a small study out there that like a lot of cardio, a small sample size of cardiologists were getting. I'm going to say this improperly, but blastomas uh, oh. it, in their brain because they were interventional cardiologists and interventional cardiology puts out a way higher dose than uh, radiology does most of the time because they have to follow like the beating heart picture and they're going through the chest and the tube is angled. So there's a lot more dose when it comes to cardiac cath versus regular interventional. But mm. I'm wearing lead. The doctor's wearing lead. Some wear protective lead hats. There are arm shields if people want them as well. There's gloves, but I think that's a little too too over the top just because you still need to be able to feel what you're doing because your whole job is like in these is right here for the most part once you get access then there's shields from the ceiling there's shields in the bottom that hang from the table most of the time and as the machines get better the dose is getting reduced by like a quarter the place that I, i just started They had an older Phillips machine that was putting out, we'll just say a gray for a case. That same Mm -hmm. case will be done on their brand new Phillips machine that we're training on this week for probably like between two to three fifty milligray. So like at the some of the tubes are a lot hotter on older generation technologies. So yeah. I watched one of the machines switch and we had, we had a similar process and the dose was just unbelievably, it was like a third from room to room in my old, at my old hospital. So that was a, that was a great tip. So we're winding down. I think this has been an excellent conversation. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, it's just enlightened me so much. I really think our radiology students that listen in any other texts, I know I would be interested after this uh, this podcast in looking more into interventional. So hopefully this inspires technologists that maybe feel burnt out in the fields that they're in to go look at interventional because it is an option, like you said, to learn on the job with some some didactic courses as well. Um, but work life balance. A lot of people wonder, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to take a lot of call. What light can you shed on that as far as how to maintain work life balance in interventional radiology? So. It really just depends because a lot of places have a lot of different shifts. So I work with people that do eights, tens, twelves, uh, part-time, full-time, and they just kind of divvy up the call based off that. Now, the place that I'm working has made a big effort to eliminate a lot of that stuff. And they put like night shifts on and weekend staff. So I was fortunate at my previous hospital, I was in a university health system and we were the community hospital. So very few things got us out of bed in the middle of the night. So like that is nice. But when you're in a big community or like a trauma one center or a university setting, you're going to have call and you're probably going to get called in a lot. So if you're looking for, if you're looking for Something with less call, a community hospital or an OBL is an option for you. Just know that if you go to an OBL, you might have limited hours because they may not work every day because they have a clinic day, or you may end up doing a lot more work like ordering and inventory. And you may be helping with that clinic day by like cleaning the rooms or something else. So, it's all, you're going to give up some, um, right. or th- you got to sacrifice something because you either get a lot of staff and not a whole lot of call or like no call, but you don't have a lot of staff to kind of help with the ancillary stuffs. And you kind of have to learn where all these products come from and how to order and stuff like that. So it, I, I've always just found balance um, because we've had five people on call, but there are definitely some places that were based that you may end up taking call 20, 25 days out of the year, out of the month. And that's a lot. And yeah. um, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation. I would love for you to leave our listeners with maybe just some 
information that you found beneficial when it comes to interventional radiology or, 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 or tip? Just something you would like to share to end out our podcast. Yeah. If you decide to get an interventional radiology, I keep two little things in the back of my brain, uh, two little mantras that I have. The enemy of good is better and everything is doctor dependent. So mm. what those two things mean to me, the enemy of good is better. You can keep ballooning something and something else will pop up. But at some point, you just got to stop because you're just fiddling. And everything being doctor dependent, that means like I'm not like I may have control of the table, but I shouldn't get frustrated if the doctor wants something different than I, what I thought. So that just gives me room to not. Well, he's not doing what I want to do it is not about me. It's not, really not even about the doctor. It's about the patient. And so, like, if he changes his plan, everything is doctor dependent leaves me in that space to not be upset that it didn't follow my plan. Well, you have left us with a lot of a lot of good information about intervention. Thank I you. hope you come back and share more um, of your years of experience, not only as a technologist in interventional radiology, but in education and training. Because these are conversations in our field that we need to continue to have because many people get into radiology and don't understand the opportunities that they have in this field. You do not have to leave radiology. I mean, I 21 years, I have only reached, scratched the surface and there's so many more things that I could do. And I'm grateful to this field and grateful for you for being a guest on the podcast and sharing about interventional radiology. Thank you for having me. Oh. I hope you enjoyed this podcast today. Thank you so much for listening. This is just one of the many free resources I offer to my clients to dump unhealthy habits and begin living. Be sure to visit my website for more free resources and health coaching. Again, thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share this podcast with others so they can join the Let's Chit Chat podcast. Have a great day, you guys. See you next episode.